Hey everybody, welcome to the Story Studio podcast. Uh, today we're getting, this is the final of the State of the Industry podcasts and so you we're going always to- always get me excited when you say final and I'm waiting for an episode. <laughs> It's the final, but it is the final episode in a way. It's the final episode, but then there's a, a hell's worth of unending episodes. Well, ironically. Okay, Dave, it's the final episode where we have to interview um, somebody, which isn't that good. You don't really have to be on your best behavior as much. I like no, that interview people. subjects means less uh, of, of us. Oh, that's true. Yes, I prefer less of yeah, us. Yeah, because remember the first episode, like 14 episodes again or ago, when we started out and Dave was talking about rubbing butter on himself? <laughs> you guys remember that? If we could just host a show where people interview themselves and we don't have to be involved in any way whatsoever, that would be the <laughs> ideal show. You know what? I bet you there's an app for that. Where <laughs> you just like feed in your questions. Yeah. And it's like... Please tell us a little about yourself. And then like <laughs> they just go, right? But but it's like a decision tree. There's all these if thens. Yeah, perfect. You know, I once went on a podcast as a guest and the host sent me their list of questions in advance. But then when we got on, she just read the questions. Like one after <laughs> you know, like I, I've, been on, I've been on that podcast. Yeah. I've been on that. I've and then if you deviate, show. then that then they're like, well, what's your favorite moment? You say, well, I don't really have a favorite moment. Why was that your favorite moment? And it's like, oh, man, <laughs> one of those. Oh, no, I've got to skip five ahead now. You Love know what it. we didn't talk about at all during, um, I mean. Wait, not- hold on. I want Dave to answer this. <laughs> glistening butter? I don't know why. Oh, no, we did talk about that. <laughs> we did talk about glistening butter. That was back in episode one, Dave. Oh, okay. Um, it was in What to Expect, which oddly – we didn't follow up with that at all. <laughs> so now we've delivered. Maybe Can Dave uh, write what to expect when you're expecting the worst. <laughs> I, you know funny what? You should, funny you should mention that. <laughs> I, I think that's a hell of a title, Dave. Um, I, what, I actually was going to do, and now I'm putting it out there, and some asshole will steal it. I was going to do a parody of that book, like, but like just the very worst parenting. Example. Right, right. You're never going to. You were going to do it. Well, there's <laughs> like, a lot of things I'm going to do. Hey, someday. Can we, why don't we all take turns? Li- each of us can list three things Dave's going to do. Hey, right. I got an exercise bike in my garage. This someday I'm gonna fucking this put together. The self-publishing podcast. I, I'm curious about um your your exercise bike. Is it, did you ever write about that on your blog? Blog to fit. <laughs> <laughs> Does it have the neutral bullet on top of it? That was Project Thirty Days. <laughs> <laughs> Neutral bullet on blog. blog to fit. Um, ju- just in case, for those of you at home who don't know, Blog to Fit and Project Thirty Days <laughs> were two of his failed blogs about all his exercise and weight loss. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> they they weren't failed. They were just neglected, like that child on the train. And there will be blood. <laughs> I started another one back in January. I just never told you about it. And I did like one inch. <laughs> Oh my God, that's amazing. Please, please send me a link right There's now. There's like a Dave's graveyard so of websites I've created. Dave's so skittish on telling Sean about things that he's gonna do, he's doing. We're going to discover that he's like, you know, this this like award Academy Award winning actor or something. And like, like oh, I wasn't going to tell you. I don't think it's anything like that. I think if you went to his house, he'd probably have like all these, you know, like the Winchester Mansion in NorCal. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think that's what his house is like. like. the dead staircases and doors to nowhere. Yeah, all these Started things, rooms that go to nowhere. <laughs> oh, all right. You can tell we're punchy because it's the final life. Episode. Well, yeah. okay. So what I was going to say is I don't think this is an oversight at all. So so what we're doing in this episode is kind of just talking about the first season that we had and kind of all of our takeaways because we've talked to a lot of, you know, insightful, valuable people. And, um, you know, the point is to, to get smarter. And I think it's always a good idea to um, process you know, and we're lucky enough to have, you know, this studio, this friend group, this peer group where we can um, talk back and forth. And I think it, it really does help us to learn because we're not ever learning in isolation. And even, you know, we're just publicly doing it right now. We've talked to all of these people. What are the things that we're learning? What are the things that, you know, are going to keep us motivated and, and excited uh, about this industry that we're in? Um, so I, I do like this breakdown. But as I was thinking, like, seriously, we were just talking about, um, you know, decision trees and if then AI for podcast interviews. And we, we touched on a little of that kind of stuff, like um, during the, the conversation with Joanna, for example, you know, forward AI and where that's going. 
um, you know, uh, Bonnie got real hyped for like 10 seconds on this AI plot <laughs> um, uh, thing a, a week or two ago. And then, oh, no, no, this technology's not there yet. But we're all very bullish about that kind of technology. Um, but one thing, I, I don't think this is an oversight in that it was something we should have talked about that we didn't. But as we're talking about this, um, I wish that I had maybe talked to Joanna or, or somebody if it had come up. But I think that, that an interesting future part of storytelling, not indie publishing necessarily, but is that kind of bot um, decision thing. So the example um, uh, that I'll use is somebody that um, um, Johnny and I both know um, did a message bot named Stonerbot. And um, this is somebody who just had like a bunch of people would all always ask questions about like growing cannabis and um, soil and laws and all, all kinds of stuff. So they started with a bank of like 500 questions was, was the idea behind this um, that people just commonly ask. And you could ask the, the messenger the question and, you know, it would have an auto reply back based on the answer. If and they, they didn't could... have existential questions in there, they're completely missing the boat. Cause every stone person I've ever talked to. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so if there's a, if there's an answer, I'm glad you said that Dave, if there's an answer that Stonerbot doesn't know or, um, or, uh, or they're just, it's intentional like that. They're trying to be funny. It'll say something like, I don't know, man, I got to think about that one. <laughs> right. It has, those I put it somewhere programmed in it. Right. So I think that there's a really interesting way that, that storytellers are going to be able to impact that kind of experience. Um, and I think that stories will get more interactive as the AI gets more sophisticated and I don't really know what that's gonna look like. I think there's two pieces to it. There's a marketing piece where storytellers are gonna become very, very valuable um, to marketers who you know, can guide consumers through story-based decisions. But just for us as storytellers, I think there's going to be ways where we can engage a, a reader and lead them through decisions and because there's gonna be AI to support it. And we, we're already seeing very primitive ways of this happening now, but. I can really imagine where that's gonna go. So th that's an area that we didn't really talk about, but I think that is exciting just cause it's different and new. Hmm. It's choose your own adventure, but <laughs> with bots. I'm not as excited about the uh, future of AI and robots and stuff. I, I, I don't want it, don't want it. I'm, I'm excited about game. writing about how terrifying it is. <laughs> Like the science fiction side is really fascinating to me, but but the the reality I'd kind of like rather not. Yeah, I opted out, out of uh, that whole channel we were discussing for our rogue project. People started putting in things about how robots were, you know, basically going to be able to kill us. Let's admit it eventually. So I was like, nah, it's okay. I'm going to opt out of this one. All right. Well, so should we talk about things that are non-robot related? So what's the best? Oh, yeah, way but to, first um, I'd like to just uh, shout out to our new sponsor, Skippy Creamy Creamy Peanut Butter. <laughs> <laughs> it, it fuels the fun wow um okay so that, i like that that merited an interruption right no, that's kind of cool I, I have an idea to make that less weird for the future <laughs> like maybe i dave wanted just, it to be weird maybe dave just started something here um you know so how about this from now on every episode going forward just sponsor it from some random item and some on my desk yes yes <laughs> I miss our sponsors, our placements. Like I miss that, our ads. Those are so good. I, I want to sponsor things in such a way that the companies write us letters to desist and they pay us not to mention them. I just think that every week we should Wait, have that a, is new, what happened. a new thing on your desk that you're proudly is that's what it's sponsored in. And I think it's funnier if you don't prepare. It's just whatever is on your desk. You're like, oh, it's, it's sponsorship time. Just leave your Next week, out Texas Pete hot sauce. Also why good for masturbation. <laughs> yes, why is this on your desk? Why is that, that on masturbation? Your desk? <laughs> you know oh. what, Dave? I would like <laughs> I would like some elf to come in and turn your camera around <laughs> because I feel like we don't have the best view. <laughs> so I suspect this summary episode is unsatisfying so far. I vote we move on and talk about some of the things that actually occurred in the <laughs> industry. Um, Wait, are you and, saying and that Dave Skippy 
<laughs> peanut butter. Oh, it's my favorite. It's my favorite. I'm just thinking it's probably I miss not worst show ever. I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah, we keep it, inviting you, know. you on. I, I well, think the that, problem is that Dave won't do worse show ever's. So this is the where he gets them in. You can't have it both ways, dude. If you want to talk about <laughs> all sorts of non sequiturs, let's do an episode. Yeah. Well, you we got to do it earlier. <laughs> oh, well, then no. Before my family comes home and ruins everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, one question I have for everyone is, has, have you changed anything about how you're working, the projects that you're considering, like based on the conversations that we've, we've had with people, like what has changed? If anything? That's a great question. Um, I don't think that I've changed, but I think that I'm really mindful right now. So, um, and, and that's with all of our guests. So with um, Becca, who was, I think, the first person that we talked to. I don't know where it aired in the lineup, but she was the first actual interview. I mean, ever since then, I've been very much thinking about my strengths versus my weaknesses, which is normal. Like, I, I try to do that anyway. But it's been even more specifically how my strengths and weaknesses um, affect the people around me. So how can I be a better um, teammate and performer for, you know, all of you guys at the Brain Trust, but, you know, the company as a whole also, um, that requires a, a pretty fastidious level of paying attention, you know, um, to, to your assumptions and the actualities. So I think that that's, that's stayed with me very, um, it's become an omnipresent thing that I'm, I'm really trying to be aware of. Um, with, with Mark, um, same thing as I feel when listening to his, his podcast, um, I feel Mark like Dawson. Yeah. Mark Dawson. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with Mark Dawson, I feel like, uh, the message there is that really anybody can do this. If you figure out the marketing part, you know, if you've got your funnel and your funnel works, then it really does amount to traffic and conversion. Um, and I think that's a really good lesson for us, especially, you know, we're, we're learning really rapidly month to month to month to month. And I think we're going really fast, but a lot of times it doesn't feel fast enough because we're not doing anything that we, we do. It's not one product line. It's, you know, 40 or something like it's, it's absurd how many multipliers we have. So <clears throat> that means that we go slower, but you know, it's substantial every time we take a, a decisive step forward. Um, so I feel like uh, it's re it reinforces the inspiration that, look, you can do this and we're just doing it at scale. Um, so I really like that. Um, with Joanna, you know, the future is always rosy, um, which isn't, you know, <laughs> that's not a hard thing for me to embrace. But again, I liked having a 10 year veteran on to kind of reinforce that we're at the beginning, you know, that, that seemed to be a common thread too. We didn't have one guest who was like, oh yeah, this is kind of the end of the self-publishing thing, <laughs> right? Everybody was really bullish on the future. And I think it helped. But I think it was the remain. end of the amateur hour way of looking at it too. So I think that it could depend on your perspective because I think some people could say it's, it is ending in a weird way because they're, they're looking right, at Right, but the caliber of people that we had on, like that's just not the way they think because they are treating it like a business and if you're treating it like a business, you're going to see it as a market correction or an evolution, not as the good days are over, right? Right, and that's, and that's sort of the way that I'm, uh, the reason I'm mentioning this is because if you do think that, we would urge a shift in perspective. Yeah, it was really interesting to me too how um, there, there seemed to be, because we, we talked to like, like Jane, who's, who deals both in self-publishing and traditional publishing, and, um, oh, and a lot of the conversations really I think indicate that like the market is sort of coming to together like trads are acting more like indies indies are acting more like trads so indies are starting to be like uh, like let's work together there's more collaborative studios coming together there's more projects coming together and a lot of people are taking it a lot more seriously and treating it more like the business that it is and then traditional um, publishing companies are saying okay we've got to play the pricing game you know and so they're bringing down their prices and they're um, getting their authors to be more social and to, to run author lists and so it's, it's almost like that like the the divide is is becoming less big and and everyone's sort of behaving more like hey well we're all authors and we're all sort of doing this together and I think that's really interesting because it means that like 
you know, the Indies have had a huge effect on traditional publishing, but also that we can, we can learn a lot from the people who've been around for a long time. Dave, you've been kind of, I mean, you've been here from the very, very beginning. I mean, before Johnny, right? I think I remember the beginning. (laughs) No, I don't. That's actually what I'm, (laughs) my question revolves around your ability to forget almost everything. Awesome. Um, So what, what was it like? Because I mean, you've, you've never been nearly as involved in the business side and stuff like ads or, you know, product descriptions that all just gives you a headache. Right. So coming in, um, where you've, you've, you've been along for the ride the whole time, but, um, some of it as a passenger and you're participating some of it, some of it in the trunk, some up. of it in the trunk. So what was your takeaway? Like talking to all of the industry vets and, you know, I'm, I'm sure you, you are, a, you do have a journalistic mind. You are curious. Yes. So um, you're hearing all of these conversations. What did you think about the past, present and future of the industry while hearing all these episodes? Oh, I think, yeah, I think we're growing more mature as authors are becoming more professional. Uh, I think that in a lot of ways, um, you know, we're advancing and we have more possibilities and, you know, we're getting more respect than ever before uh, as indie authors. But I also think that, that, that some of the ways, uh, some of the limitations of the business uh the, the big publishing side and how you had to pay to play and stuff, they're going to start to work against us in a way. And uh, you're going to have to figure a way around that. Um, so we don't get crushed out of the marketplace. I don't think we ever will. I think there'll always be people like the people we talk to uh, who are figuring ways to do it and still compete without, you know, having to, you know, fork over every dime you make to do so. Well, that seems to like tie back into the the whole the question we've been asking everyone uh, which is KU versus Y you know that I think that um, while it sounds like for for a lot of authors KU is still where where the biggest money is I, I don't think that's an arguable point <laughs> um, that you know that the people who are earning well in KU are, are earning very large sums of money compared to to wide but um a lot of people talked about you know new platforms different platforms even just seeing like the conversation we had with find away voices and what's happening on audio right now where there was you know audible was king and audible was like we've got all the listeners and now all of a sudden you know other people other companies are are cropping up and they're starting to really eat into audible's share of the audiences to the point where Audible had to to change their whole business model because <clears throat> they couldn't compete. Right, and it was a it was a su- substantial change, and it was not like, hey, you know what? We really value our subscribers. We want to give you more. <laughs> like that wasn't their driving force. There, there was a lot of competition that was demanding that they give more for for the money. The only yeah, but, constant is change. Yeah, and I think that that's what's what's coming next is, you know, more platforms, more ways to get readers, different types of readers, different types of stories, you know, so that it's not just like, so that we don't all have to compete for the same people who are on KU, (laughs) basically. Well, so uh, go go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, Bonnie, I mean, you've been at the edges of the industry for a long, long time. So you've really seen the spectrum, right? Where Johnny queried at the edge, you know, um, I wouldn't have been involved without self-publishing. Um, you know, you were definitely a professional for a long time. So what were your major takeaways? Um, hearing all the, I mean, <laughs> you, you joined us a couple of years ago, so you've seen a, a pretty seismic shift within the company and the way we're approaching things. And you were really prepared for all of these questions that we were going to ask, because you know what kind of holes we're trying to, to fill. So what was your perspective on that? Um, one of the things that actually kind of surprised me was how, in terms of the kinds of topics that people were talking about, that a lot of them were topics that at the very first Smarter Artist Summit um, we were talking about, <laughs> right? But it's just kind of been a very slow evolution. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the people we had on, um, one thing that they had in common mindset-wise was they were doing a lot of experiments and they were talking about testing things and 
nobody was nobody was looking and saying this is the way it is. Everybody was looking and going like these are the experiments I'm doing right now and these are the things I'm finding. And I think that I think that traditional publishing has sucked at that. <laughs> Just in terms of like what I've seen people um, what I've seen people struggling with. Um, and I think it's one of the things that makes me so excited is what you were talking about, that whole how we're moving a little bit toward how traditional publishing does things and they're moving a little bit toward us because they actually do have, they do have some infrastructures that are holding them back because they've stabilized things that don't work anymore and they've stabilized things that aren't adaptable, whereas we have that adaptability and we've experimented so much in terms of editorial process in a way that, um, that even small presses, people I know who are working in small presses are not experimenting in nearly as many ways as we are in terms of like, how do we do these things that take a long time and do them really fast, but still do them well. Um, so I'm actually, I was very excited. I expected not to understand a lot of the stuff that people were gonna be talking about just because I haven't been involved in the marketing side of things. Um, but it was great to see everybody breaking things down to core principles and just saying, Core principles haven't changed. The details are evolving. And it's just the details that we need to keep experimenting with as they continue to evolve. Yeah, and the details that are evolving, I think pretty much without exception, were normal market corrections. There wasn't anything like weird or surprising if you actually look at it in terms of, you know, instead of, hey, here's this weird thing that shouldn't really be working this way. Because I mean, anyone who was um, publishing in 2011 <clears throat> that's not reasonable. <laughs> like the way it worked was not reasonable. There were not enough authors creating the content to um, argue with the, or to go up against the, the trad publishers. Like it was, it was very different. It was not, it, I mean, 10 years ago, you could tell the difference at a glance between a, a self-published book and a traditional published book. Um, now for indies who know what they're doing, that's just not the case, you know, it's, it's just not. So I, I think that if you look at the changes, they've all been positive changes, even if sometimes in the midst of them, they feel negative because either you can't get the results that you wanted, or it feels like, um, you know, we always talk about the algorithms and, you know, how much that sucks, you know, <laughs> to be slaves to the algorithms, but they are there because they're out. Amazon is trying to make a better shopping experience. They're trying to get machine learning to a place where you could trust the recommendations. So it's always been evolution. And there's, you know, I, I think what was gratifying about talking to the veterans that we talked to is that they all had perspective. They have all been through it. They've all seen changes. They've all patiently, you know, gone from, um, you know, the sky is falling to the sky is falling, to the sky is falling. And they've seen that, yeah, it's never really fallen. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm just trying to think of the things that, that, that were said that, you know, just rehashing basically what we've already heard. Um, well, I, I know, know you can't really, I know you can't really, because it sucks to say, did you have a favorite guest? Like, you can't really do that. <laughs> but can you, did you have a favorite takeaway? Or did you have a favorite, um, something that, that, that played later, or that you thought about, or that questioned your assumptions? Because that's part of it, too. Um, you know, we want to, we want to learn, and we don't really even know what we need to learn. We just know that, God, this is an industry that's constantly changing. So we constantly want to fill ourselves. Um, and sometimes the best thing about talking to uh, veteran people who have been doing this for a long time is that you've been doing things this way and they maybe have been doing things you know, this way. And you don't think that you have a lot in common, but you're both getting results, right? And so figuring out the, the common, commonalities and the differences so that you can kind of evolve your practice was that, and I know that, that for you, Johnny, specifically, you're not as involved with the marketing now. Um, right. That's what I was thinking is anyway. like, well, it sounds like some great stuff for, uh, for, for you folks who are selling the books and for me writing them. Um, uh, well, I mean, I guess it's encouraging. What are you saying? I guess we didn't really talk about creativity very much. It really was like industry and market focused. Um, no, yeah, I mean, the one thing that, you know, just hang on. <laughs> the the one thing that continues. 
Yeah, the one thing that continues to to get me, and and this is a drum that's been banged so often that I'm just reluctant to even go down this road again, but is the whole KU versus select thing. And I just object to KU on principle and we're in it a lot, right? Like you just, I don't like it and we're there because you have to be to some degree. And so hearing that wide had a lot of potential is encouraging. However, um, down to brass tacks, I don't know that I heard a ton of like hard numbers that said, yes, it's worth it. And I'm really hoped that it is. I want to be wide. I hate the idea of being in um, a marketplace that just has different sort of rules to it, right? It's just a little bit less author loyal. It's just a little bit more like churn and burn. And um, I really like the idea of selling books on Amazon and selling them on other platforms. And so I just hope that that is a viable thing and that we can continue to get into that rather than just going down that commoditization approach. Yeah, I agree with you, Johnny, that I didn't hear any any like overwhelming evidence that suggests that why it is like the next thing, right? Um, I feel and, like- and Even the suggestions that we got were uh, percentages. And the percentages don't mean a lot without hard numbers because your percentages can be skewed. We need to know is, are the people on average wide making more actual dollars than people who are in select. Well, no, I think probably on average, no. And I, and I think that the, the, the common denominator that we heard in all the wide arguments was it is more philosophical than, you, excuse me, than numerical. So um, you didn't see a lot of people who were like, oh man, I'm glad I'm wide because I'm crushing it. When I was on Amazon, I made X, but on wide, I'm making X, Y, and Z, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like you didn't really see that argument. It was more like, um, well, I, I want readers everywhere and I can write fewer books and, um, you know, it's a higher quality reader. You, you heard a lot of this and, and especially the, I'm just opposed to being, um, getting in bed with a monopoly. Like, it, but those were philosophical arguments. So I think our takeaway is that, of course, we've known that we want to escape this argument for a long time. We want to make wide viable for us. And, um, I, I think that keeping it top of mind and hearing other people's uh, perspectives, but also how they're dealing with wide versus um, select and, and some of the takeaways on wide, like, okay, uh, here's a specific one that was helpful for me was um, just talking about, look, you cannot dabble with wide. It doesn't make any sense. You, you can't have a book here or put it in and take it out or do any of that. If you're going to go wide, go wide because it's a different audience and you're going to lose that KU audience no matter what, because that's a different reader and you have to be okay with that. And we were already having these conversations internally, but I think it really did reinforce um, our overall strategy. And when we are going to move from KU to wide and why and how we'll do it and all of that. Well, I, I do think as well, though, you mentioned just really briefly in passing there, write fewer books. But, you know, to us, that's just like, oh, that's a philosophical. But I think to your average author, that is huge because like, we're like, okay, how many books can we put out this week? But if you are on your own trying to make money at it and trying to like have um, a, you know, an income that you can rely on, the fact that you could, uh, you know, need to take some months out or you could you know, say, you know what, I just want to take a break for a while and that you don't fall down the algorithm, off the algorithmic There's cliff. a churning fury that yeah. Amazon demands, like being part of that, that ecosystem just, it, it, it has a different requirement set than going wide. And I, I think it's a more complicated conversation. Um, and, and I did like that there was, that nuance was explored. Okay, well, if you're going to be wide, you have to approach it this way. And you should be a part of that Facebook group, Wide for the Win. You know, if you are, if you are wide, then think of it fundamentally as a different, I mean, not a fundamentally different business, but it is different than you're all in and select. Yeah. So the other thing I think we have to talk about, because almost every single person who came on talked about it is audio yeah <laughs> like like we're we're asking everyone you know what what's what's big what's happening now and every almost every single person was on audiobooks you know you need to get on on audio and I, I thought that was really I mean I I'd sort of expected it going in but I was really floored by just how much 
the, the tide has really turned towards Well, audio. I think the interesting um, parts about the audio conversations too, weren't just that audio is growing fast because we all know that. Like we've been talking about that for years and years and years. Um, and, and some of the numbers at, you know, at the pace of the audio is growing in comparison to um, regular books is kind of staggering. But I think what was interesting about some of the audio conversations was the nature of that audio. They weren't just talking about straight audio books. It's it like narrative podcasts and um, Spotify getting into it and the way, you know, we just talked about this, but the way Audible had to adapt their program to something new and they've got like free content and people are experimenting with maybe putting stuff out and getting paid on the back end later after they like box stuff up, but putting it out for free up front. There's just, a, um, audio to me feels like it's a little more wild west, like the way, you know, um, uh, self-publishing in general was 2011 2012 2013 i think while that's solidifying um audio is definitely more exploratory and uh there's more chances you can take and it's it's interesting too because there's just it's a whole different ball of wax because you have the investment is just really high like you can't just get in the game a anybody um can get in the uh, self-publishing game i mean it is it is cheap it is you certainly can get better as you go along and you should and you should pay for better edits and you know covers and all of that but the baseline you know cost of entry it, i mean you can use google docs <laughs> and you cannot have it edited and you can get a cover on fiverr or make it for yourself like there is very little uh, barrier there but even if you could record your audio um, that's a terrible idea, right? Unless you're a voice actor, but even then you're probably not the right voice actor for your book, right? Um, because casting is a whole thing. So you have that up record an audio book with like the kids and animals in the background. <laughs> right. Like there, you know, you, you, there is a certain baseline quality that you need with audio. Um, it, which is funny because that baseline isn't really there with text like there are some truly garbage books and that's not me disparaging the indie community <laughs> like everyone listening to this has seen some garbage for Decoy sale wallet. um and <laughs> and it, it it can do well and um but that doesn't exist in audio you don't have audio with a bunch of flubs um that's for sale like you just don't find that um and there are also fewer players so you know um when we talk to find a way like they kind of inherited a really interesting place in, in the market, you know, with find away voices. And so, um, you know, you had audible who had this just deadlock of a, a, of a monopoly forever. And now that's really loosening and you're just seeing all these little players and libraries. I think libraries for audio could be huge and that just makes sense. So I, I think it's really exciting but not just because it's an explosive area of growth, but because I think it's going to um, give us some new forms of storytelling. Um, yeah, I think that it also like, you have to, to look at people, you know, and more and more people are getting into to audio, like podcasts are becoming more popular than, than they used to be. And because and they're that, also and, a place that's getting um, adapted, you know, yeah, so you're and seeing- it's, it's, it's a feeder into other forms of audio. Once you're starting to listen to audio and you're like, oh, I can do my chores and you know, listen to something enjoyable, then it's just this whole other um, area of entertainment that has opened up for you. And so, so, and then as well with COVID, nothing is, you know, at some point we're gonna run out of the pre-recorded TV, right? You know, at some point we're gonna get to the- No, we're not. <laughs> we're gonna need I think at some point we're gonna see a lot more audio kind of and audio dramas and things that are happening where people can be separate from each other during production of that and so I think you have the audience going up the number of platforms going up and then the amount of content I mean there's a lot of content but it's still like because of that barrier to entry of the cost it's not going up as fast as Kindle did when people started you know reading ebooks so I think that it's sort of this perfect storm and maybe it can forge some new paths that then can open up to, to eBooks, like, like having other um, you know, libraries and having other forms of uh, platforms and ways that we share our eBooks and stuff. So yeah, I, I think audio is really exciting.
Yeah, some of that stuff is pretty exciting. The idea of, you know, every time I hear libraries, I think that that's kind of cool. I actually don't know if we've had a lot happening in libraries, but it's one of those things kind of like um, success on any of the other platforms where it just seems like, I don't know, people are figuring that out and it's exciting, but I don't know that we really know how to make it work yet. But <clears throat> being wide is certainly, or I guess with audio, you could be wide on audio by itself and do it that way. Yeah, Fat Vampire is, I think, in libraries. We should know that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put that on the Area 51 call list for, for next week. <laughs> um, so uh, biggest takeaways? Uh, well, I, for me, it was definitely like a reiteration of a lot of the things that we've been thinking. And so a lot of our assumptions were getting um, sort of affirmed, but also like just here really great to hear it, interesting people talk about these topics uh, but for not me, just I, interesting but passionate too right like yeah. everyone we had on is I, I mean you know what i really enjoyed was our uh our K-Lytics episode um you know like numbers should not have been that much fun to talk about but but it was an illuminating exciting episode and I think that that's just not because numbers themselves are exciting. It's whenever you have somebody who is so passionate about what they're doing and they're like world-class at it, that's just, that's a wonderful experience to be able to absorb that and learn from them. And, and I think that all of the guests that we had on were people who are really good at what they do. They're really focused and they were genuine with their time and knowledge and willing to share. And so, um, yeah, I'm with you, Neve. That my my biggest takeaway was just that um, the more things change, the more they stay the same, and the stuff that matters. Like you can go back to our very first episode in 2012, I think it was, um, and you know the fundamentals that we were talking about then are the same. <laughs> like they're the same. You know, their tools have changed and platforms have changed, but the idea of you know writing quality stories and connecting with your readers. Um, all the, all the changes that have happened since are, are really about an industry finding itself and growing up. And, um, you know, there's always going to be growing pains with that, but long-term, I think they're for the better. And, you know, there's a lot of artists right now who aren't, they're writing, you know, they, they were in other jobs 10 years ago and, and they didn't really believe they could do this. And if they could, it was only through the query process. And there's been this great equalization and perhaps we have to work a little bit harder and a little bit smarter and we have to learn how to do ads and we have to learn how to collaborate. Um, you know, there are things that it's not as easy as it used to be, but it never should have been that easy. And by focusing on the fundamentals, like, you know, maybe not anybody can do it on their own, but anybody has the potential to, and certainly as a collaborative unit, I believe, anybody can put something together and, and be successful as storytellers. And that is really exciting. And I didn't see or hear anything in any of our conversations that um, violated that basic um, idea. Yeah, but I still feel like I learned something from, <laughs> from every single person on every single episode. There was something I was a moment where I was like, wow. And um, for me, the highlight was, was uh, Becca because talking to her, you know, like it was a great conversation, but then afterward, like going away and thinking about that, I've actually changed some of the stuff that I, I do day to day, you know, like I used to do to do lists and now I'll, I'll jot them down, but now I have done lists. Like, so, so I have this wall, okay, visual aid. So sorry, podcast <laughs> listeners, you won't be able to see this, but I have post-it notes on my wall. And every time I do something, I just write it on a post-it and stick it up. And then as my day goes on, the wall fills up and I just get to feel really good about it. That's something I totally just invented for myself, but it made me feel so much better. And through the conversation with her, I realized, you know, I should be experimenting with my own um, systems and how I can, um, how I can be better at what I do. And so it's just little tiny things like that, but that has had the biggest impact on, on my day to day. And, and so I really am just so grateful that we had that conversation. With yeah, you. I like what you just said there because I feel like I got two things from this series. I got validation that what we're doing is right and that we just need to keep doing the things that we're doing. And I got permission 
to experiment more and feel confident in what we've already accomplished and know that, you know, there is that, uh, that safe area for us to navigate around in because we do understand the space. And I think that's it too. The more, you know, it's like what we always say about writing. Um, you know, you can write like Chuck Palahniuk if you, if, if you understand language like Chuck Palahniuk, right? If you are, you know, an amateur writer trying to kind of ape that style, it's, it's going to read like an amateur writer. But the more you understand language, the more rules you can break, right? And so um, I, I think that's true in, in any business. The more you understand the business, the more rules you can break. And we've been at this for a while now. And, and honestly, I like breaking rules. And I think that our studio is filled with people who like to break rules, which is part of our problem some of the time. And so um, I, I like knowing that, okay, well, here's the rules you can break. Here's the rules you really shouldn't break and, and having some parameters there. But that cocktail of validation and go ahead and, and, and get buck wild, I, I think was, was really good for our studio. And I could feel it. I could feel the energy coming from the podcast episodes directly into our Area 51 marketing meetings where we were talking about some of these ideas and we had you know, renewed energy. And um, I don't know that there was any single strategy that like came from a podcast episode and then we're like, oh, we gotta try that. That's not really what I mean. It was just kind of like the, the energy of these discussions permeated our new discussions. Yeah. Um... All right. Yeah, I was just going to say that I really, I really enjoyed the Strengths Finder one too. But that since that topic has passed, then it feels like a little like, hey, remember that thing a while ago? Me too. <laughs> um, any final thoughts? I mean, it, I, I don't want to keep beating to death. This. Yeah, I also like that too because I would say a lot of the same things. Any, any final um, parting words on this issue before we leave the state of the industry for an indefinite amount of time? Do we want to tease um, what's yeah. coming up next? We want to talk about what's what's going to happen next week and for the next uh, nine nine weeks. I think it's nine episodes for the next season. Yeah. So yeah, I've lost we... track. What what uh, I don't remember what that is actually because <laughs> well, we've, we've I think sort we of like and done in a flurry here. I think we should invite Bonnie to come out and introduce season two if she's up for that. <laughs> Um, yeah, season two is going to be um, the core curriculum season, and it's going to be basically digging into um, the whole creative process, starting with cultivating a creative process and all the way through to self-editing a book. Um, so it's, it does get into the weeds a little bit, but hopefully there's like a lot of, a lot of takeaways that people can use to um, apply to whatever part of their creative process that maybe they would like to improve. These are my favorite yeah, episodes. Yeah, Dave, and, Dave yeah. shows up for all of these. Yes. <laughs> and for anyone who has not yet kind of gotten to know Bonnie, because Bonnie has been, um, you know, on some of these episodes, but uh, if you're new to, to the studio, Bonnie is our story genius. So she's the person who, uh, who makes sure that all of our stories work and she adds improvements to them. And she's sort of like the developmental story person within the studio. And uh, you know, funny story. She's about a wizard. Bonnie. She's a story yeah, wizard. Yes, she she's a total wizard. So I heard Bonnie on episodes of um, self-publishing podcast from a couple of years ago. And I was like, oh my God, she's a genius. And I need to learn from her and I need to get everything that she's ever created. So I went through one night and I bought every course that Bonnie's ever done on craft. And then I was like listening to them, learning so much. And, and I just thought, well, I have to work with her. So I messaged Bonnie and I was like, Hey, you don't know me. I'm just, this was before I was with Sterling and Stone. I'm just some random person. And I, and I asked her if she would work with me um, on my, on my own novels. And she said, well, no, I'm sorry. I only, I only work with Sterling and Stone. And so then I was like, okay, I got to find a way to get into Sterling and Stone. So, that so Bonnie, work. we have you to thank for Neve. Is that what we're, we're understanding here? <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was, it was all about Bonnie. I was like, how can I work with Bonnie? <laughs> so yeah. So I yeah. think it's going to be really great because it's Bonnie all makes us all, all better, so much better because she, the, the thing is it, you can have editors who um, make things structurally sound or, um, are trying to make the story cooler or more commercial or any of that. And, and Bonnie will touch on all of those things. Um, 
but her primary concern is how to make a reader care more. <laughs> and like, that is, that is, it's such a simple thing, but it's such a big thing because that's what people actually care about. They think they care about the story or the explosions or whatever, but like no one ever went to a movie four times because of an explosion. It was because of the way that explosion made them feel when coupled with whatever the character with, who dealt with, with that explosion. robots that could turn into cars, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, it, it, granted, I know that that argument, you know, does get a little thin because there is some stuff that's just garbage that succeeds. But by and large, the stuff that's classic, the stuff that becomes blockbusters, it's because there is some emotion there. There is some reason for people to care. And Bonnie is always bringing it back to why does that matter for the character? Why does that matter for the reader? And those are the questions that really matter with story. So, well, you know, my brain tends to think about how do we subvert that trope or, you know, how do we do a really cool version of that? How do we make it clever? Yeah, right, right. How do we make it clever? You know what? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a copywriting truism that you should always pick clarity over cleverness. And that's a hard thing for me to follow because I tend to like cleverness over clarity, which, which is why I'm very grateful for Bonnie to be my editor because I get to be clever on the draft and then she gets to say, knock it off and, and then, <laughs> you know, take, you know, leave it where it's appropriate, but get rid of it where it's not. And it, like, I never, ever, ever would question a Bonnie edit because I know where it comes from. You know, it, it comes from, there's been a couple of times she didn't get a joke and I'm like, okay, well that only got cut because she didn't get it. I'm putting it back in. It, to it be fair, it's probably a bad joke. It wasn't rhythmically wrong, <laughs> but like, almost always it's it, it's it's not necessary in the scene right um so so it gets excised and that putting the reader first is so important and writers we want to do it but we get in our own way a lot and um, bonnie just doesn't she cares more about the story than she cares about the author and she loves us as authors for sure but her allegiance to the story is her allegiance to us because she wants us to be the best storytellers we possibly can be. And so we're very valuable to have that in this company. And um, I, I think we're, um, we're eager to share it with you because she is a font of knowledge. Yeah, so season one was sort of more on marketing and, and on you know how are you gonna get your books to readers? Season two is gonna be how are you gonna write better books? So. We're excited to come back <laughs> next <Yeah>. week. <laughs> so we'll see you next episode for the first one on um, uh, core curriculum. All right. Well, thanks everybody for listening to the Story Studio podcast in the State of the Union. Hopefully, your union is solid now. I know whatever that means. Uh, <laughs> it's been thanks, everybody. thanks everybody for listening. I'll see you next time. Adios.